Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bill Gustin coming from you from the Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Training Center in Doral, Florida, along with uh, our brother, Jimmy Davis from the Chicago Fire Department, Captain Mike Dugan, retired from Ladder 123, uh, Clark Lamping from the Clark County Las Vegas Fire Department, and our special guest, Brent Brooks uh, from the Toronto Fire Department, a subject matter expert on um, high rise fire protection, not just firefighting. I wanna talk about that because it's more than just firefighting. And I wanna shout out to somebody who we all look up to here shortly. But before I do that, uh, thanks to uh, Key Hose, that's keyhose.com, take the key challenge, try to kink the key. And it comes in a, a variety of different grades and, and styles. Uh, you can get the old school, double um, true ID, double uh, jacketed with a rubber lining. It's not natural. It's like EPDM. It's not really rubber. But uh, And then you can get the uh, combat ready, which is a through the weave that has an additional protective uh, jacket. And you can get that in the combat sniper is, a, from what I understand, is a, a combat ready version of a, a little smaller for that 160 gallon a minute, I think it's about a seven eighths inch tip. Seems to work good that a lot of departments are looking at. So you got a wide variety. Uh, don't go cheap on hose. Um, so a shout out to them. Uh, I also wanna give a shout out to uh, somebody that we all look up to very highly. Uh, and that is Jerry Tracy. I had the privilege to sit in a class taught by Jerry for the West Palm Beach Fire Department. Not just in West Palm Beach, but he tailored, custom tailored this class for West Palm Beach with a number of their buildings, both inside and outside. He had the names, he had the addresses. He made this tailor-made for West Palm Beach. But I, I got a funny story to tell. If you've ever been to a Jerry Tracy class, you know, Jerry, like most of us, hates to give breaks because 10 minute break, trying to get everybody back with a bunch of firemen is like herding cats. So Jerry doesn't want to give a break. He didn't want to give a break. So, but he was told, I guess, because he reluctantly says, okay, I got to give you a break. Now, 10 minutes, I need you back in your seats. Well, at the end of 10 minutes, half the group is still socializing. Well, in the words of my buddy, Ray Bell, Jerry got his New York up and he says, he takes the mic and he says, you in the back of the room, have you got a story to tell? Is it more important than my story? Then come up and take the mic. Otherwise, take your story outside. And if you want to be in this class, you pipe down right now and take your seat. He tuned up half the class. I wanted to stand up and cheer. That guy is my <laughs> frigging hero. He'll be teaching with Jack Murphy. But those two guys, and they will be, uh, debuting their book. Uh, if you've never taken a class by those two guys, they are a team because it has, it's not just high rise firefighting, it's high rise fire protection. Brent Brooks gets it, Clark gets it, Mike gets it. It's not just stretching from a standpipe. There are so many other things. Jimmy Davis, did I introduce you as first or did I miss you? Remember, my screen is a little messed up. Jimmy, the imposter, is actually from the Chicago Fire Department, but he's impersonating a uh, an FDNY firefighter today. So, um, Brent, um, we're going to let you, you are our special guest. And uh, I understand you had a promotion and which you, I'm sure you were very qualified and deserving to have. I really don't recall where we left off. I know that uh, on the phone, Jimmy and I were talking about controlling the smoke. And I think that's where we left 
off last ship. And I know Jimmy wants to uh, weigh in on smoke control as well. So Brett, uh, Brent, uh, you can take it, take it from here. It's in your capable oh, hands. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Jack Murphy and Jerry Tracy just did a podcast yesterday on fire engineering that talks about their new book. Uh, just over an hour long, but man, you just, you can't turn it off. It's, it's just excellent stuff. And for, you know, especially the, the, the people on, on this group here, you're, you're going to eat it all up. So I'm very excited about that book. Very excited. It'll, it'll certainly help connect the dots, but yeah, when we, uh, when uh, we talk smoke, that is, that is what's killing uh, occupants in these buildings. And uh, we need to be able to recognize uh, the health of the building or the ventilation profile of the building uh, when we pull up. So when we pull up to a high rise, typically we look up at the building and we look for signs of smoke or fire and that's it. We stop right there. What I'm trying to tell our crews is take a second and see what the ventilation profile of the building, but add another layer of what tactics can we do in this building? So if we pull up, we see balconies, we see seasonal stairwells. Um, you, can, you can look at that building. Okay, I have eight improvised standby options that I can do. Or I look up and the building's all glass is it active or passive ventilation systems? You may not know that till you get inside, but hey, I just lost a whole bunch of improvised standby options. I'm looking up at the building and, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna have glass issues. This building probably has positive pressure isolated stairwells, we're good. Or if I see doors open to the exterior that came on during the alarm, I know they have positive pressure isolated stairwells. So these are signs that I look for. Now, if I don't see that, I know that our department has the equipment to be able to do that positive pressure isolation. So that's gonna be our fourth and fifth in truck. They're bringing that uh, equipment forward and they're gonna take a 1960, 1970s high rise building and turn it into that modern building by positive pressure isolating those uh, stairwells. And we hear you know, people trapped or we hear that the stairwells you know, now gone dirty. We're gonna send firefighters in to try and rescue those people. But I can tell you with positive pressure isolation, you cannot run as, as fast as that smoke moves. You cannot, if, if I wanna help those people, I need to do positive pressure isolation because I can get to them faster with positive pressure than I can with uh, boots on the ground firefighters. They're coming, we're coming to get you, but we need to send uh, that stairwell protection. Does that make sense or <laughs> did I go off on a tangent? <laughs> no, it makes, it makes tremendous sense. And, uh... Um, you mentioned that if you see the front doors were open automatically, is that because uh, if you pressurize or if you put a floor in an exhaust mode, you have to have some make up air, otherwise you've got a vacuum and you're cavitating. Uh, I recently watched a video on a atrium smoke control system. We usually associate with doors closing, Brent, but in this case, doors open because we have to have, you're moving a volume of air out or smoke out. You got to replace it with something. Otherwise, it's not going to move. So is that what you were, that, is that what you were alluding to? Yeah, and, and when we study those systems, um, you can be fooled because the, the, the doors that do open up um, will be a stairwell that goes from top to bottom. And if more than three doors are open and those, that stairwell loses pressurization, I found that ground door will actually close again on its own because the pressurization has changed within that, within that stairwell. So if we want to get access to that stairwell, we have no access through the lobby, which is a good thing when you look at modern buildings. We have to come out of the lobby, get to that stairwell. I know it's a good stairwell because the door has been open for us because of that positive pressure. But if I know that door closes, there's multiple doors open within that shaft. Uh, that's the same in South Florida. There are very few uh, multi-story buildings that we can get inside the stairwell from inside the first floor. It's outside, they discharge directly to the outside, which is really the only complication is they don't even have a door handle. So on an automatic alarm, does it uh, justify damaging the door? Uh, that's, you know, that's a rhetorical question. Uh, if I could ask Captain Mike something, uh, over the years, uh, the FDNY has always been at the forefront of um, 
smoke management. And it used to be, and of course, I'm going to defer to you. Get to the roof, open up the roof bulkhead. However, now I do believe that at least for high rise buildings, that's no longer an automatic function of uh, the first new truck, Mike. If that's the case, uh, can you kind of explain why they changed the way they were doing business? Because when we first started, it was nothing shall deter the roof man from getting to the roof and doing his job. But if you're ventilating the roof and creating a, a path, depending on the time of year, the temperature differentials, the building inside, the neutral pressure plane, all of that in different stuff coming in, you're going to affect the smoke. So you might have people, if it's um, you know July or August, you open up the roof bulkhead, you might have people who are below the fire, who are you are now going to impact with that smoke moving there because of the, the pressure differentials. Um, the smoke movement is amazing. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day about the, the 30th anniversary of the, uh, the February bombing of February 26, 1993. I was still a fireman back there in 43 truck in Spanish Harlem and going to the World Trade Center was like going from New York to Miami is what I would equate it to in fire responses. You know, just you never, ever, ever going down there. And we're going down there on our lawn. So we know we're going to work. But in that, the bombing was in the C2 level in the sub-basement. And the uh, smoke detectors on the 110th floor went off in less than five minutes. And it was a Friday, it was the first Friday of Lent, and it was about 36, 37 degrees outside. It was cool. And the inside temperature of the building was about 73 degrees. And that smoke just, it is amazing how fast that smoke travels. So you have to take this into account. And you're going to create a flow path depending on where our people are, if we have control of the staircases whether it's the attack, whether it's the evacuation stickers, all of this stuff has to be taken into consideration. And very honestly, most of our ventilation is based on the officers on the fire floor, whether they want it or not. And hearing guys getting up on the roof and going, yeah, I got about a 10 or 15 mile an hour wind hitting me in the face. Hold off on ventilation, hold off. We'll deal with it on our own once we get... So we have to understand that we are going to, you know, uh, every action is an equal and opposite reaction type of deal. We're going to have to understand where we are going to push this stuff because it's not all like the old days where everything went outside the building. That doesn't happen. Uh, Clark, uh, the MGM grant, uh, and, and uh, Jerry touched on it in his class. Uh, the fire, I don't know if it extended beyond the, the casino or the restaurant, but yet, Clark, uh, I do believe you had people on the top floor of the hotel that died of smoke inhalation, and it had to do with the air handling system, HVAC, and Clark, could that same fire happen today on the Las Vegas Strip, or has there been changes, some retroactively to prevent that type of smoke movement from happening today? Uh, mechanically, yes, Bill, they have. <clears throat> we completely wrote, rewrote all of the building and fire codes after the MGM fire of 1980 and the less known fire was the Hilton fire of 1981, not even 90 days later that killed eight people. So we realized that in Las Vegas, if you have a town that's relying on tourism and you kill over a hundred tourists a year in hotel fires, you'd better find another, you better find another source of income. So uh, we rewrote all of the building codes and fire codes. And for a while, and I think we still are, we have the strictest fire codes in the world. So we were the safest high rise city in the world for many, many years. <clears throat> so the answer is yes, Bill. Mechanically, they did set up systems and uh, procedures and policies on how to make these buildings safer uh, as far as air movement and things like that. But they didn't take the human factor in there. Right. We have just like we always talk about. Yes, we have uh, stair fireproof stairwells. 
that are charged and overpressurized, but then we didn't account for every door on the floor, every floor being opened and releasing all that pressure. So it's, we still have a lot of problems with that. Um, and one of the things, uh, Bill, that killed a lot of people in the MGM, the uh, stairwell doors were locked. They decided that uh, if we lock the stairwell doors, we'll prevent people from coming up to stairwells going into the rooms. So they found uh, piles of bodies at the end of stairwells uh, in front of a locked stairwell door. So now it's, it's code that no, you can't, you cannot lock stairwell doors, obviously. That's uh, something else that changed. But was um, it retroactive? Yes, it was absolutely retroactive. Okay. All buildings had to be uh, sprinklered. The MGM was not sprinklered at the time uh, because it would cost, I forgot what the number was, about $100,000 to install. When they built the building, it would cost about $100,000 to put sprinklers in. Um, they decided against that. And uh, <clears throat> the building burned only about, it was only about, I think, 12 years old when they had the fire. And I can't remember the number, 30 or $40 million in lawsuits they paid out to save a hundred thousand dollars in sprinklers and Jim, jimmy you and i don't have that type of retroactive um policy uh ordinances uh yours is the i think your nemesis is the pre-1975 buildings and mine are the non-sprinkler condominiums so whereas in las vegas they have made these changes retroactively these other buildings are grandfathered in and i i have to wonder out loud how many lives have been lost in fires in so-called grandfathered buildings now i have a couple of questions if you don't mind bill for clark number one when they uh demanded <clears throat> the retrofit was that only for the hotels, because what Bill's talking about with the condos is a total different thing. And a lot of places will not go to a condo complex where all of the senior citizens are living on fixed incomes and say, you got to put a sprinkler system in now. So was it just the hotels, number one? And was it just the sprinkler or was there also smoke control in the HVAC systems, dampers, doors, smoke detectors in the HVAC? Is all that included in the retrofits? Uh, Cam Gustin, it was, I'm sorry, Cam Dugan, it was just for the high rise hotels. And the reason for that is we don't have a lot of high rise condos. Back then in the 80s, we did not have a lot of high rise condominiums in Las Vegas. We don't have a lot of high rise commercial either. The majority of our high rise is high rise hotel. Um, now we have a few and they are, they fall under new codes. And <clears throat> the new code state that obviously everything's, everything's sprinklered. And uh, the second part of your question, yes, they did have uh, smoke control systems, fire protection systems, other fire protection systems with compartmentalization. Um, <clears throat> um, they changed the materials, the decorating materials. One, one thing that made the Hilton Hotel so dangerous, um, it leapt from elevator lobby to elevator lobby to elevator. It was an arson job. And back then in the 80s, the elevator lobbies had carpet on the walls. That was the decoration in the 80s. So they had carpeting on the walls. So that, that, uh, Fire auto exposed from elevator lobby to elevator lobby, elevator lobby, and I, you know, the fuel load inside that elevator. Like I have pictures of it, completely destroyed every single elevator lobby where people were evacuating to, still going to the elevator lobby to evacuate the hotel, um, and they were met with massive amounts of fire and heat as that as that fire just extended. So retroactively, they said, you know, no more carpet on the walls. Turns out that's a bad idea. <laughs> yep. Also, I'd like to mention, uh, speaking of smoke movement, how smoke kills people, I just read, uh, what's the uh, magazine that uh, FDNY puts out? WNYF, um, with yes, New York yeah. firefighters. Yep. Um, so Chief Lieb uh, from FDNY, he wrote a great article on that East 181 uh, story fire in the Bronx. Um, and turns out that that fire was in one one apartment and it was a two-story apartment one apartment the door stayed open it extended out of the hall and directly across the hall was another apartment with the door open so the fire was in one apartment went across the hall into the second apartment and that was it that was the only fire 19 people were killed they said they were finding dead people on the 19th floor on the 15th floor one single apartment caught fire yeah. and i thought 
the amount of smoke, when I watched that response and the amount of smoke that was pushing out of that building, uh, it's amazing to me. And we had one not nearly as severe or as large. We had the Alpine Motel fire in Las Vegas. Six people died. That was a three-story motel. One, one apartment caught fire, had a queen mattress. It was uh, tiny, tiny apartments, like 400 square foot apartments, a kitchen, and then a three quarters of a queen size mattress burned in that fire. And the whole first floor was completely destroyed. Smoke damage to two and three, six people dead in that fire for three quarters of a mattress and a tiny kitchen fire. Um, so it is amazing. And even I talked to the, uh, the in investigators, even the investigators scratched their heads and said, we, I can't figure out how much damage was caused by just this, right? And it was an old building. So they said maybe it had 32 coats of paint on the walls or something. We couldn't figure it out. But just looking at the pictures of the amount of damage from these small fires with these, with these new plastics and foams and the amount of smoke they generate is mind boggling. And the other thing, the other thing that you have to take into account on these things is what I said earlier, but it's very important is the wind. Because if you have that fire burning and a window fails or you open up a door and you change the flow path, you are affecting it with wind. If you are feeding that fire oxygen and everything else, you are making that fire, getting that fire so hot that it is going to come down on wherever, whatever direction you open up and give that to go, it is going to be a problem. You are in the barrel of the gun, so to speak, in that situation. So you have to think about these things. I mean, firefighting has always been a thinking man or woman's job, but it's becoming more so understanding fire dynamics and smoke travel. Clark, when you're talking about um, lock, lock stairwell doors, we're still going to have that problem. It's, it's a urban legend that when the building goes into alarm that all the mag locks drop, they, they um, certainly don't. In, in, a, in a commercial high rise, they, they don't. And if we look at our city, like we have 98 consulates, I believe, and most of them are in high rise buildings. Like that's another country within our country at an elevated location. We do not have access to those, those type of buildings so that uh, if, I, if I was to say one thing about smoke is keep that building envelope the same, leave it as found. Um, because as soon as we, like, uh, uh, like the captain said, as soon as you start opening up an entrance and an exit, uh, we're going to move that smoke and you, you, you can't outrun it. Uh, Jimmy, uh, I was just thinking, well, uh, three quarters of a uh, polyurethane foam mattress and I was thinking in the early 70s when I would ride with my dad, hold up all companies coming into uh, 2950 South Low. Uh, it's just a mattress, just a mattress. And a lot of times they'd knock it down with a hand pump and take it out to the hydrant and flood it. Just a mattress today is a big deal because it's going to be polyurethane foam as opposed to jute and cotton years, years ago. Um, another thing about mattresses is we had a fire in an apartment in the projects. And I called for the investigator because there was only thing was in this room was a, was a queen size bed. And this was such, it was hotter than an oven, hot as an oven. So I figured it's got to be an accelerant. It's got to be an accelerant. The investigator came out and he says, Bill, there's no accelerant. What the hell? I've been to dozens and dozens and dozens of mattress fires. He says, Bill, take a look at the other mattresses in this apartment and in this apartment building. Well, you know, they, the mattresses are on the floor. They're all on the floor. There's no, no bed frame. How old do you think this mattress is, Bill? I said, well, God, probably as old as the building. So it could be 50, 60 years old. Can you imagine the amount of human body oil over the years that has been absorbed in that mattress? It burns like paraffin, like it's a hydrocarbon. And that's what he attributed the, the heat release, release rate to uh, in addition to the foam. But uh, Thanks, Bill. It, I'm, I'm going to go vomit now on that. Thank you. <laughs> Come on. I thought you were staying with me in my room there in uh, in uh, Indianapolis. Yeah, I know that I, I kind of lack. You probably take more showers 
in one day than I take in a week. And also, I go in the shower. I'm a real man. My son's a metrosexual, so don't don't feel bad about that. <laughs> but you go in the shower with a cream rinse and a moisturizer. Too much information, that. Bill. What's that? Too much information. Too Talk much information. Shower. Well, I'm going to give you some information about um, our uh, our good friends at Keyhose. That's Keyhose.com because we're just about at the halfway point. And uh, as I said, take the key challenge. Also, they have a uh, several different models of a large diameter hose uh, as well. But uh, don't go cheap on the hose. They also make a special high rise hose uh, that is for extremely high pressure pumping operations. Um, and also, I want to just something really wonderful happened to me. Two things happened today, uh, this week. Uh, on March the 6th, I had 45 years on the job. Uh, and I'm in the, uh, right now we've got a bunch of classes going on. And one of them is uh, uh, terrorism. And there, a guy stops me in the hallway. He says, you don't know, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no. He says, well, I was with the New York City ESU. And we, you were on, we were on the same steering committee to develop standards in the organization for the urban search and rescue task forces. And this was, we were meeting in 1989, 1990 on a monthly basis at the National Fire Academy. So Peter, could you bring that picture up? See, I lost everything in Hurricane Andrew. So to, to get this brought me great joy and, and pride. Do you have it there, Peter? Put it up. Stand by, Bill. Yep. Okay. In the meantime, Brent, what uh, what hose packages are you using, Brent, for high rise? What sizes and what lengths? Uh, we're using uh, two and a half, so sixty-five millimeter. That might that might confuse you, but no, we're using two and a half. They're all fifty-foot sections. They're uh, in the Denver um, type load. Um, we send two crews up with the exact same equipment. So we get right off the hop, two crews, uh, improvised stamp pipes up to 30 stories. And we have the ability to do a reverse lay up to three, uh, 300 feet off two crews. Perfect. Yep. Uh, the guy on the left is, uh, as I said, we were meeting on a monthly basis, um, at the national fire Academy. And this is, uh, this is in 1990. Uh, the fellow on the left is from Long Beach, California. His last name was Samuelson. That's a very young Bill Gustin. Uh, that is Ray Downey. And uh, who we lost on 9-11-01. The older fellow behind was a very interesting guy. He came from the mine industry. So his perspective was extremely interesting. And he contributed a hell of a lot as far as atmospheric, remember this is 1990, atmospheric um, uh, examination and, and sampling, uh, uh, collapses, shoring. Uh, and then the guy that gave me the picture is that next guy there with the curly hair. He was on the New York ESU, uh, an extensive knowledge of, of uh, rescue techniques. He was also a volunteer in Long Island and then that's Chuck Gerald from uh, Fairfax County. They were like our uh, our code sister team. Uh, when we went international, we would go, like when I went to the Soviet Union and went to the Philippines, we went with our brothers on, uh, on Fairfax County. So that's why I still have a, a close relationship with some of the people on um, uh, Fairfax County. Uh, Dan Shaw isn't here today. He's probably getting, he's probably at another promotion ceremony for himself. Uh, if he gets any more badges, uh, bugles on his badge, he's going to get scoliosis because his badge is going to be so heavy. So uh, it's going to look like a field marshal. So anyway, that's uh, brought me a lot of joy because I never thought I would see that picture again. So uh that's all I got to say. As I said, I'm going to be leaving a little bit right at two o'clock. I got to go, maybe even earlier, because uh, Mike and I got to go out. To, we're going out to lunch together, Mike and I. 
All right. You're so underdressed for lunch, Bill. Hey, man, I'm in the- a little bit about these fires that we were talking about, Bill, with the smoke movement, because in the fire service, when we have these fires, when we have fires in Las Vegas, we give them names. When these fires go bad, we give them names. Okay. And I go back to, um, you know how much I like to read, go back to one of the things that I thought was brilliant. There was a guy in World War II and all the bombers were coming back and they were all shot up. And somebody said, let's look at all these bombers that are shot up and see where they're shot and we'll fix that area. We'll um, make it a little more secure. So, and then one of the guys who was brilliant looked at it and said, no, 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 no. Look at the ones who come back where they're not shot because that's what's knocking the other planes out of the sky. The areas, these come back and if they're shot up along the wings, the wings are holding up. They're shot along the tail, the tail's holding up. Something else is causing them to, um, to, to crash. To, to crash and burn. Let's find out where this is. We have to go back to these fires that we've had and look and see what we did to impact this stuff and how we created the smoke movement in these things to change it from where it was and what we're going to do to make that better. And positive pressure is one of them. Well, we got to figure out the ways that we're going to make sure that we make this fire attack the way we do all of this stuff with the wind-driven stuff. And, you know, with the fire attack and the smoke movement, I go back to one of my earliest fires with Schomburg Plaza, where we lost six people. And I remember the sound of a 12-year-old girl jumping from the 34th floor, hitting the ground. Her clothes were on fire. And we lost seven people that day. And it, all it was, was a compact of fire. But the way the building was built, it was built under federal standards, not the city standards and everything else. We've got to understand what's going on in these buildings and learn from what we do. And if you're not sure, for the younger men and women in the fire service, ask somebody, hey, should we open that door or leave that door closed? And if in doubt, leave it closed. Leave it static until we know what's going on. And Mike, to your point, uh, I think the day of the uh, muscle memory that we wedge every door that the firefighter goes through, wedge the door open, wedge the door open. Now, really, the only doors that should be wedged open are the ones with a hose line going through them. And then once what we do on Miami-Dade, once we got enough hose on the fire floor, the wedge, the door is closed just enough or wedged or we put a, a, you know, a cherry bomb in there, just enough for the hose, just enough for the hose. What does that do? It, remo it uh, reduces the amount of open surface for the smoke and it enhances our positive pressure. Uh, additionally, we were wedging open every friggin' door on the first floor. And on a hot summer day, what are we asking for? Reverse stack effect. You got a fire on the 23rd floor in a sprinkler, smoky, sprinkler building and end up with smoke in the lobby. Why? We brought it on ourselves. And then that becomes a problem with our air usage because now to get up there, if we're not going in our elevators, we got to walk up in the staircase, 20 floors on air and then fight the fire. Each one of our people is going to have three to four minutes of time, if that, because of all of the air, the consumption up and down and everything else. Uh, Brent, are you there, Brent? Yes, sir. Do you think it's feasible that you have a high rise building and you have a reel of high pressure air hose and that you could raise a fill manifold and you'd have to have some kind of containment vessel you don't have to, but be in compliance. And you could have a fill station. You could improvise your own fill station on the upper floors of a high-rise building. Because I have no people cop. here say that it can be done. Uh, we've got a guy that services our um, scuba tanks. Hydros are SCBAs. He has a, a um, he's, he has 
installations in resorts in uh, all throughout the Caribbean where they have a bank of cylinders up in the main hotel and then a high pressure hose under the ground and out to a boat dock where they can fill multiple dive tanks with a high pressure hose. He was a firefighter in the, in the Keys, but his main expertise is he's an expert in everything compressed gas. He says it can be done. And he says he's already doing it, but he's just doing it on a horizontal plane. Have you guys ever looked into something like that as progressive as you guys are? I know who is, and it's uh, the Calgary Fire Department, and they are looking at getting a containment vessel to be able to fill them up, you know, safely, because that's what we have in our stations. But they're simply looking at doing an improvised standpipe uh, with those airlines, uh, just like we do with our hose, an improvised standpipe with the airline to this containment vessel. But um, yeah, it's uh, Calgary Fire um, is, is is actively looking at that. I don't want to I don't want to uh, criticize fires. Fires is the way to go. But fires, it's just not going to happen in my area. Fires is a great idea. Firefighter air replenishment system. And if it can be implemented in a building, that's the way to go. That's ideal. But we deal in reality. And the reality is we're not going to have the fire system. I wish we could. It's the best thing going. But we're not. Uh, can you give me a contact for Calgary that I can get a hold of? Absolutely. And there are three fantastic firefighters. Okay. I, I, know, I know Pinders uh, reached out to you, Jeff Middleton, and um, uh, who's the other one? Geez, Lyndon Cousins as well. Yeah. Okay. All dialed in firefighters. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I really want to look into this. Now, Brent, you mentioned the last time you guys have duct work. And how do and you have, utilize that for smoke management in a high rise building? So what we want to do is, um, and, and we're so uh, excited about firefighters is, is we have this dirty hallway and we have no smoke uh, in the stairwell. And we start saying, we've got to get rid of the smoke out of the hallway. Well, we don't, because we know that if those doors are closed, you know, half the building's safe. Um, and what we do is the spiral ducting was you bring it onto the fire floor, we get it in the fire unit. And even if it's wind impacted, if we get that spiral ducting out the window, break 90 with it, now we're making an entrance and an exit in the fire unit. And that pressure coming in finds that ductwork and comes back out the exit. What we can also do is bring a fan, and I'm not a fan of bringing, I'm not a fan of bringing fans up to the fire floor, but if you're using spiral ducting, now I can use the hallway as spiral ducting. And if I open up a door, I can clear half that hallway to the spiral ducting. And I can use a fan to kind of supplement that. I can close that door, open the other door, and I can clear the rest half of that, but it's going into the spiral ducting. So we're keeping the building um, clear of smoke by using spiral ducting. We have 75 feet on each high rise truck. We really do need to get a hundred feet but our next um, evolution is we have 18 inch spiral ducting. We're gonna pump that up to 20 inch spiral ducting and we'll have fans that we can put in line, which just makes this process happen a little bit faster. Brent, I'm gonna put on my technical editor hat for fire engineering. <laughs> you gotta get off your tuchus. Get off <laughs> your tuchus and your three or four bugle tuchus and Write that stuff down. Let's get it in the magazine and share it with the fire service. That's why we like to put engineering in fire engineering and what distinguishes us from some of the other uh, firefighting and fire protection publications. Keeping and the, the and engineering the, and, and fire engineering. So and the good news uh, is, when can I expect that article, Brent? Well, 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 the good news is, and, and I haven't been a writer and I've talked to you that, and, but uh, there's a, a Toronto firefighter named uh, Maurice Doyle, and he's got 40 years on. He's dialed in. He's more dialed in than I am, and he's going to help me uh, get this stuff down. I have all the pictures. I have all the tactics. I have, I have it all laid out, and he's going to uh, be part of me, and he's going to make this happen for us. So it's Maurice Doyle, 40 years on. He's going to time out at age 65. Um, yeah, it, so he's been the game changer 
uh, for our high rise program as far as putting pen to paper, which I haven't been able to do. So he's going to connect the dots for us. So he's your Shakespeare, your ghost writer. Absolutely. He'll be the ghost writer. Yeah. I do a little ghost writing myself. Um, Cosmopolitan magazine. You see it because, yeah, no, 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 I'm being serious. In the, uh, I, I love to watch Mike Dugan's reaction when I say this stuff. <laughs> In the grocery checkout line, Cosmopolitan, those articles, how to drive your man wild. That's actually me. I'm the ghostwriter for those articles. Yes. <laughs> this whole time Mark, I thought Mark, it was Mark, Jimmy I Davis. Some copies behind I thought it was Jimmy Davis cabinet. this whole time. Uh oh, I'm getting a comment now. What do I see here? <laughs> all I can think of, all I can think of is what Halton would say to you if he was here. <laughs> he says, Did you take your meds today? You're on a roll this afternoon. And the other one says, Help, yeah. Check, check it out live. Make them right. Okay, there we go. Yes, yeah, so great. Um, we encourage all you guys. Um, writing sucks. It's time consuming and it's tedious. But um, Bobby Halton used to tell me, because I used to tell him that writing sucks. We all know. But he says, Winston Churchill used to say he hated public speaking, but he liked to have spoken. In other words, once it's down, once it's published, it's your, it's your words and it's, it's your intellectual. Well, it's not your intellectual property anymore because you got to sign a, a work for hire. But um, for all of our viewers, man, don't be intimidated. Uh, by the degree of difficulty, you do not have to be an old salty veteran. You do not have to be, uh, have a master's degree. You do not have to be a fire protection engineer. You may only go to a couple of fires a month or a, a year, but there's some experience. There's something that you have learned. And that's what we're looking for in that magazine. Lessons learned. We don't really want a book report. We want lessons learned. So. For our viewers out there, don't don't hesitate to submit something. They got people down there that'll fix it up for you. Just get your thoughts down on paper. They have great editors. The editors are phenomenal in fire engineering. And the other thing is for the people who want to uh, start teaching and teach at FDIC and stuff. Yes. If you put an article together on something, and very honestly, none of us, Bill, myself included, have ever had an original thought. We all just expand on other things that are out there and how it works for us. If you go out and put this pen to paper, they will help you. And if you do that, it's a lot harder to knock your class if you are in the magazine. The last thing for the brothers and sisters who want to write, you can get in touch with Bill and I. We're out on all the social media platforms and everything else. But when you write an article, what I told people, the sophomore slump sucks. Write an article, have a second one planned, the outline done. So when they ask you for more information, you have a second one planned. But it's how yep. you start. Yep. Yep. Uh, Mike does a lot of uh, fire focus uh, where uh, for some reason, uh, somebody on the particular fire department doesn't uh, care to write or can't write. And uh, Mike does an analysis uh, from his point of view based on his uh, experience. And um, what was your last one you did, Mike? The uh, renovated building with the Bowstring Trust in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Blew out the walls like uh, Vinny Dunn talks about in the collapse of burning buildings. It was, it looked like a brand new Java Juice gym, the whole nine yards. It was a, and all of a sudden, if you, were too close to the building and didn't look up, you wouldn't realize the characteristic hump <coughs> that bowstring truss and those side walls, when the, when the roof let go, those side walls blew out with explosive force. And I understand, Mike, and maybe Jimmy knows this, that the, uh, the truss in the front now, the um, hip truss, 
the hip mm-hmm. thrust, the hip raptors, the hip raptor. When you have a slope in the front and in the back, and it's it's uh, it's the bearing surfaces are the uh, the rear wall and front walls, and the the last or the first truss of the roof system. And I've never seen it myself, but my dad has told me that when those hip rafters fail, they will push that uh, parapet wall out much greater than a, a, a distance equal to the height. Have you ever heard or seen that, Jimmy? Yeah, Captain, I uh, haven't seen it. I, I have seen videos of footage uh, before in the past uh, from Chicago and also FDMI fire. You know, sometimes they tell you how important building construction is, that even sometimes with a bowstring, the corners of the building could also blow up with explosive force. So that's when you want to back off on bowstring. This is the last yep. uh, fire engineering. And I don't know if you can see the picture of the bricks on the ground. Yeah, you can see the hip raft is going up on the truss on this wall and look at the cars underneath there buried in that with the sidewalk and everything else and this is in the february 2023 fire engineering and you can see how those hips pushed that wall out and if any of us the brothers and sisters were standing there it wouldn't have been a good thing for us that's why we need these people in command who are watching out for what we are doing and Cap, that's where you want to change your back off distance, maybe modify or adjust your collapse zones in accordance with the bowstring. And it the corners. Much differently. Correct. And the corners. Mm-hmm. Corners just as dangerous. Yep. Yep. You know, I'd like to have on again, and I want to give him a shout out because I think he's watching. There's one of our Canadian brother from um, um, JJ. Yeah, uh, British Columbia. British Columbia. Vancouver. Hudson. Vancouver. Uh, he called me yesterday morning. It was six o'clock his time. And he just wanted to shoot the bull before uh, he's having a cup of coffee. He hadn't started his uh, his shift yet. And uh, so we talked about all things construction. Um, he is a very sharp young fella. And uh, especially when it comes to um, an up and coming trend with the uh, massive timbers of uh, that's not the correct term but it's it's like plywood on steroids they're going to build massive timber high rises i think they already wooden have wooden high rises bill wooden high rises what wooden high called rise. a yeah clt cross laminate timber there you go there you go now i know maybe mike in your experience jimmy in your experience i know of no mill constructed building massive timbers, no concealed spaces that has been destroyed by fire when it is occupied and operating. It's always, always when it's abandoned, that's when they burn. Or when it's renovated and they Ah. create void spaces. Okay. If If they renovate it and because of heating and the cost and everything, some of those trust spaces, they bring the ceilings down and they create a void. And people are walking around going, oh, yeah, I kind of thought I smelled smoke, but I didn't see anything. And it's burning for hours up over their heads with electric or whatever else. Those are the two times, Bill. You're 100% right. A wide open one, never. You know, they have the floors. And again, the floors, a lot of times when they're old machine shops, they're oil soaked and that wood will burn forever. But when there are people in there, we get water on it very quickly. It's when they are vacant or when they are renovated and they create voids to put walls in and things like that. Right. Excellent. And Jimmy, the gentrification. When my dad worked at Madison Street in Aberdeen, that was Skid Row. Now, I don't know what that neighborhood when I was there a few years ago. It looks like the... Uh, the yuppies had moved in, the uh, croissant uh, munching uh, Chardonnay drinking Volvo drivers had moved in, in those buildings. And I am certain that they did what Mike just said with those old, cause they were flop houses. 
Yeah, Cap, you better bring your checkbook if you want to buy property over there. That that completely flipped and you gentrified. Uh, in a I hope way. I. I, I um, hope I didn't offend anybody. You can drive a Volvo yeah. with strip Chardonnay. Okay, all right. And yeah, so that so was a big trend too, and I think it's a big trend not only in Chicago but elsewhere. And they had those conversions, those uh, conversions to the loft uh, apartments, which is a big desire for those two. So all they did is reconstitute and reshape the building uh, to accommodate, uh, you know, a multi dwelling uh, with the high ceilings, uh, but. Yeah, very expensive. We, we call that polishing a turd, Jimmy. Yeah, but it's amazing how they're repurposing these buildings. They find or a lack of use, you know, in the past, but then they, they reemerge uh, again to a, a really good, uh, desirable multi dwelling setting for people that have the money to afford it. And one thing about that that I always tell people whenever I'm teaching or talking at a class or anything else if you are the officer, in command of a unit or the incident commander, and you have two reports in a building you think might have been renovated, and they're differing reports on the fire. If I'm on the inside and I poke a hole in the ceiling and I say, we got nothing, and now you got a guy who's up on the roof or on the floor above, and he says, we got fire everywhere we open up a wall, understand that there are probably void spaces that you don't see. And you have to tear down everything to get to where this fire is. I've had a couple of multiple alarms because of that. When we're down there, there's nothing here. And they're up there going, oh, it's rocking and rolling here. Well, then you see that they drop the ceiling two feet. And there's an original lath and plaster ceiling or something above it. Again, if you are in there and there are two differing reports on the fire conditions, always go with the worst, and start the resources you are going to need coming to you. Mike, that is so true. And it's, um, you got an outside size up, you got a roof report, you got an inside size up. Uh, I can think of a fire that occurred in, in Boston where the first indication of heavy fire in the cock lop was from the roof, it was with the companies on the roof. And I agree, it's, it, and this is a very important lesson to be learned from somebody that has learned it personally. You, Captain Mike, if your reports are not consistent or the incident commander says negative, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. No incident commander wants a dissertation or justification of why you should remain in the building when he orders you out of the building. He expects you to acknowledge the order and go out. He can explain it later. Get out of the building. He's seeing something you're not seeing. So, and one of the similar red flags, Mike, is what you just said. When you got... It could be an arson fire, Mike, where you've got fire in different parts of the building, two separate fires. But that is, is critical. And I think we're just about ready to wrap it up for today. But I got to tell you, I think we need to go into reconnaissance reports next, uh, next month. Let's bring on, bring on the drones. We'll bring on the drones. I'm an old timer. But I think that there's a huge future, all right, in a present for drones, uh, for uh, reconnaissance information. So, um, Brent, are your is your department using drones? Uh, unfortunately, we are not. Everyone around us is, but not us. But we do have that 230 foot tower that has like the thermal imaging and all that. So it's similar to a drone, but not not. It's, we're we're certainly not there yet. Hamilton Fire next to us, they have it. And is it ever successful? You call 911 on your phone, the drone in a park, in a lake, wherever you are, that drone can go right to your location and walk the fire department in. So the, the city next to us are, are using it and with great success. Okay, that's great. Uh, Mike, you and I, I got to get back to recruit class 151 and you are going out with your lovely wife and Brent, sir, chief. Um, Thank you so much for participating. We're going to have you back. 
Uh, I'll be expecting that that a rough draft of that article, you know, sometime later. Uh, I was on it now. Yeah. Do what I did. Write it on a legal pad. That's what I did for years. Okay. <laughs> so, Mike. All right, Phil. Get my warmest regards to your lovely wife. I appreciate and, it. Uh, and Jimmy. Jimmy. Give my warmest regards to your lovely wife. And Clark. Give my warmest regards to your lovely wife. So until next month, thank you, Kehoes, for being here for us. Uh, thank you for viewing this. It will be archived. If you didn't see all of it, you can watch it then tonight, maybe with some adult beverages. Some of my humor might be more humorous. But, uh, guys, um, it's always great. And uh, I feel so privileged to be, be a part of this and be with you wonderful guys. So until next month, for all of us, all our brothers and sisters in the fire service, may God keep you safe in this most noble of professions. See you next month.